I just got, I got spooked by it all. You know, I just kind of found it really, really tough. You know, I saw that, you know, the impact it had on my stepdad, who I was extremely close with, um, on my mum, you know, on the family, on the livestock, on the land, and uh, I just had to get away. I just sort of had to, had to move on. That was Andy Carbone, and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. Here at The Regenerative Journey, we know that good health is related to good food and good practices, but understand that sometimes the right food choices are quite hard to put into place. But our good buddy, Cindy O'Meara, at the Nutrition Academy is helping people break old habits to create a much healthier lifestyle. So in support of what she's doing, we're offering a $100 discount to all our listeners. Simply enrol in their functional nutrition course and enter the coupon CHARLIE100, that's CHARLIE100, the Nutrition Academy. Say goodbye to old food habits and hello to a much healthier, happier life. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and internationally and their continuing connection to country, culture, community, land, sea and sky. And we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott, an 8th generational Australian regenerative farmer. And in this podcast series, I'll be diving deep and exploring my guests' unique perspectives on the world so you can apply their experience and knowledge to cultivate your own transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with your host, Charlie Arnott. Quick plug for our workshops coming up in December. Uh, the first one is at, at the farm at Byron Bay in the northern uh, rivers of New South Wales on the 2nd and 3rd of December. And then our next one is the next week, 7th and 8th of December at, the, at Hannah Minow here at Burrawa in the south of Slopes of New South Wales. It's our two-day introduction to biodynamics course. Uh, theory in the morning, crack in the afternoon. It's two days. Jump on charliearnett.com.au, the events page there, to book your tickets. Sneak these workshops in before the end of the year, before the festive season, and uh, hope to see you there. And this week's episode of The Regenerative Journey is with Andy Carbone. I caught up with Andy at the farm at Byron Bay, overlooking pigs and ducks and people and all sorts of wonderful things, cattle, um, chatting about his journey. He grew up in central Queensland, went away to boarding school. Um, he... Uh, Worked on various stations um, up in up in northern uh, northern Australia, um, then attended uh, acting school um, for a few years there, which is a major turning point for him and his development and sense of self. Um, he had a uh, um, very interesting story um, to tell. Um, did Andy on the on the on the, at the farmhouse there, um, and all culminating back and uh, going full circle back to a more regenerative way of life. Um, where he's now the general manager of the farm there. Um, and it's a fantastic story, lovely bloke. We had a really good yarn, and I hope you enjoy our yarn as much as I did. <laughs> you too, <tube. Hello. laughs> Andy Carbone, welcome to The Regenerative Journey, and welcome to the... It's, ten, it's, it's, bit, it's been a bit of a regular studio now, the, the veranda of the farmhouse here at the farm at Byron Bay. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. <laughs> you mightn't be thanking me at the end of this, <laughs> mate. Um, I'm going to hit you up with the. the I interviewed um, Damon Gamma on this very spot about tw- oh, it'll be more than twelve months ago now, and I hit him up with the straight up question, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> the hard ones. You yep. you you start alongside Damon um, in how's that? Yes. The Amazingly successful Australian miniseries about the um, cricket and the one day is yes, yes, I did. And, and you played Max Walker. Yes, I played Max Walker. Was it that? Was that your real mustache? Um, because the, the one you one you're sporting now is pretty pretty good. <laughs> yeah, look, they had to paint a little bit in. I was a little bit younger then, so. They actually did use a bit of marker to sort of did they? yeah fix up the gaps. Yeah, bit of, you had a bit of bum fluff. A little that bit of bum fluff. <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah, no, it was probably a little bit of bum fluff, and they had to do, do a bit of extra work. Yeah, yeah. I had to score that gig. Um, well, I I was an actor. <laughs> 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 we're gonna, we're, yeah, so we're going to get to we're going to get to that. 
Yeah, so um, yeah, it was pretty fun. It was a very fun show. Yeah. It was good. It was um, good people. Good, good, good crew. Very good crew. Yeah. Look, it was. We got to play seventies cricket players, and I kind of lived it a little bit as well. <laughs> it's like off camera and things like that. It was. Uh, we got what do you mean? Like, because I know um, they used to drink a bit of grog. They'd love their beers. Did you? Did you really? Did you? Did you do like the? You know the um, the you method. Sun, you sunk your method yeah. acting. <laughs> you really sunk bit. yourself into that. There was one, no, not naming any names, but there was one guy who was told by the director to lose a bit of weight, and then he actually told us all that he'd been eating chicken schnitzels every night. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, he was method acting. Yeah, yeah, he was just having way too much fun. <laughs> so we weren't in pubs that much. Yeah. Your mate didn't didn't need to be. Yeah. Now talking about pubs, we aren't at one right now. We are at the farm at Byron Bay, and I probably should have moved my wagon a bit further away so we can see more of it. But um, mate, what does it mean for you to be here in this spot? Not necessarily talking to me, but just here at, at the farm at Byron Bay, looking out there. I mean, what are you what are you seeing? Or what are you feeling when 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 you when you're here? Yeah, look, I just see great opportunity here. You know, I see great opportunity to educate sort of the wider community. You know, a lot of people who probably don't understand a lot about farming or food or where good food comes from. Um, I see a lot of hard work that's gone into this place already. And, you know, a lot of good people who were very passionate sort of got it to this place to where it is now. And um, I feel really fortunate to have the opportunity to try and sort of build on what's been what's been done here and move forward and and value add I suppose to to the good work that's been done um, I also see great opportunity to educate people in a number of different number of different areas on this place mm. so we have got the livestock animal integration here and then we've also got some really good uh, market gardeners here and then we've got the macadamia orchard and stuff like that so there's an opportunity to sort of sort of rejig some of the things that are going on here and actually create a good sort of educational program here to, to the public. Because yeah. what it is for those who aren't haven't been here and haven't heard me bang on about it before it's, a, it's 80, 80 something acres um, market gardeners um, there's chickens, there's pigs, there's cattle. Um, there is, as um, Andy said, the macadamia orchard, and it's sort of a bit of a mix of of tenants and 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 some of the some of the livestock owned by um, by the owner. Um, and it's it's six years old, changed hands last year, um, and it's fantastic. Suffering a bit now, obviously, with the lockdowns and all sort of caper, but um, it's yeah, you know, it's it's a wonderful place. Mm. Yeah, it's, and it's just great for people to actually see where their food's coming from mm. and then actually sort of taste some of it in the restaurant and things like that. So, And there's a lot of passion here. You know, there's a lot of passionate people. There's a lot of people who are looking to, you know, use the – really, like, manage their land or look after their land or caretake their land the best they can. So it's sort of – it's a really kind of inspiring place to work and be. And it's not – there's not many of places like this around, is there? Like it's quite unique, I think. You know, in in its context and what it's actually doing. There's places that are maybe a bit more urban places that uh, have got a, a chicken or two and some carrots growing. But you know, in terms of and this is not a five thousand acre farm by any means, and and you know, two hours from the coast, this is in a pretty unique spot. Mm, definitely, and I think the new owners definitely see the potential in that and see the potential to actually expand and. When I came on board here, we really spoke about trying to create a showroom floor for what regenerative ag is and what what it can be and what's what you can actually do on small farming, you know, small plots as well as, you know, on a on a larger scale. So And how long have you been did you, when did you start here again? Remind me. Uh, November? December December yeah, November, December, December last year. Yeah. That's right. Mate, let's um so it's a bloody good spot to be sitting, I have to say. That's why I enjoy doing it um, out here. We've actually got you've got a you've got a wonderful flock of bin chooks over there. Yeah. yeah. When when do they when do we get to see them on the menu? 
I don't know, but they're the, they're the pride of the place, really. They're hard like, to fatten, though, aren't they? <laughs> they're hard to catch, too. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> I'm not sure we. I'm not sure we're going to go there. Uh, I can see some pigs over there, though. So they are. They, there's, there's, they hang out. There's animal happy. integration going yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. I actually, my cousin's husband, he's a turf farmer, and whenever he sees ibis around in his property, it actually tells him that he's got a certain grub. In the ground, oh, so the, is, it, is it the the cock chafer? Don't laugh. It's the name of it. It's the name of a grub. I don't know. I don't know. I think that's that's definitely your realm. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make it up. Anyone who knows this, pass your pests, they will know about the the cock chafer. Yeah, um, maybe they're after them, hmm. mate. Let's get into before we go down into the lavatory too far. Tell us. Um, as is the name of the, the podcast, Andy, The Regenerative Journey, I'm keen to understand, because I know bits and pieces of it, more about your regenerative journey. Mm. Um, how far back do you want to go? Like, you know, I don't know, day one, day 5,000, oh. you know, where – just paint, at least paint a picture of your, of your when you are a young fella. Yeah, okay. So uh, my mum, on my mum's side of family, on my mum's side of the family, she's um, – they go back to kind of first European settlers in central Queensland, yeah. and they a- kind of, eighteen something. I got no idea, but you know they were they were they were around. They've been I think it's like six six generations or something. I don't yeah, know. cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they around the Drummond Range, so they sort of settled around that, which is just sort of west of Emerald. Yeah, cool. Okay, in between Emerald and Alpha. Yep. And then my mum married. Uh, Obviously, my dad, who is Italian and was born in Italy and came over when he was five years old after World War Two. I did not know that. Yeah, so he oh. he uh, he came over. Um, my grandfather on my on my dad's side, he fought for Italy in World War Two and was a prisoner of war in South Africa and stuff like that. They owned property. They owned a farm, like a little farm up in the hills behind Salerno. And mm. they just couldn't make it work, so they decided to come to Australia. The whole family went everywhere. Some went to Argentina, New York, and then, you know, my grandfather came to Australia and then sort of settled around the Glasshouse Mountains up there. Yeah. And then my grandmother, she she comes from a long line of beekeepers. So That's cool. Yeah, yeah, on my, on my dad's side. So, beekeeping where? Where was that happening? In Italy. Really? Yeah, so they they were I think they were like six or four generation beekeepers. So up That's in the awesome. hills, you don't think about beekeeping as being into, well. I guess there are. I don't know some people are, are sort of father and son, but wow, it's it, Italian beekeeping dynasty there. Yeah, and they they sort of settled in Brisbane, so in around New Farm, and sort of oh like fifteen fifteen years ago, she saw a swarm of bees in the sky. She walked inside and got two pots together and started smacking them together and dis- disorientated the bees and they came down and sat and swarmed down there and we had bees in the middle of Brisbane. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've never heard that technique before. Yeah. Bang, yeah. bang, bang. Yeah. And, and then she, they settle. Yeah, and they settle and then she sort of, they got a hive and we had bees in the middle of Brisbane at her place. That's awesome. Did you know, yeah. did you know that she was a bee whisperer back then? Back I didn't then? know. No, that was going, what's she doing? doing, the man yeah. duck with yeah. the cans? Well, I can't actually understand probably because I can't speak Italian. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, yeah, so that was that's that was my mum and my dad. And then, you know, when I was sort of younger, they split and went their own separate ways. And mum sort of moved back to central Queensland and then remarried and sort of got back into into the farming world there and, and sort of, um, you know, my stepfather, he was a – he was a grazier and had some land and sort of built on that. And so that's where it all started, yeah, for me, on the land. Mm. Before we go any further, do you have any socks on, mate? Uh, yes, I do. Do you want to take one of them off and put it on your mic? On your mic, Okay. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want me to put mine on yours, <laughs> and I don't want any of yours on mine. You sure? <laughs> this, <laughs> I'm not sure what you're going to do. This is great. Well. Okay. There we are. Just, just got a bit of a whistle there. That's better. I should have <laughs> brought my bamboo ones there. <laughs> Your bamboo. <laughs> show off. There we go. There you really? go. Good work. Is that better? Yeah, it should be. Just, just, it'll just take that whistle out of it. Um, so, 
yeah, so central Queensland yeah. as a young tacker. Yep. How, uh, how was that? What was life like on you know on a, on a property out there? We lived in town for a while yeah. first while we were developing the property. So you know, one of the, we bought seventeen thousand acres, sort of just north of Emerald. Um, it was quite a you know rough rough block back then, and you know a lot of we did a lot of development, a lot of pulling land and country and stuff like that. Um, but like yeah, back to the question. Yeah, it was great. I just you know I got to ride horses, motorbikes. Had a fair bit of freedom. Mm. Mustering cattle. Yeah, cattle. yeah. Would it be all cattle up there? It was all cattle, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had a little bit of farming and David's family came from sort of wheat growers and stuff like that as well and then he kind of transitioned into into beef cattle. Mm. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then what happened then? So lovely, you know, country upbringing in the middle of Queensland. Mm. Went, to, went to boarding school. Mm. Spent five years at boarding school. Brizzy. Yep, in Brizzy. Brisbane, for, Brisbane. For those international listeners. And then finished school and then went mustering. Went sort of out into the Channel Country, sort of around Longreach and started working on, uh, work for AA Co out there. Um, it was mainly just a sort of growing out block. So they used to get a lot of cattle from the northern blocks, truck them down to, to us. We were on the Diamantina. And then they would sort of, would get them to a certain weight before we'd send them off to the feedlot, sort of around Emerald. Mm. So that was that was the first property after school, yeah. And why why that? I mean, it kind of might be an obvious question because you uh, just making sure my dog's still there. Um, obvious question because it's it was your is what you you did. Yeah, he's still there. He's still there. Yeah. Um, but like, did you have the, did you have the sort of the thinking? Oh, you know, I'm from farming. I wanted to go do something different, or was it like the natural thing? I'm just going to go out there and go further out west. Oh, uh, my grandfather on my mum's side used to manage properties in the territory yeah. and stuff so he managed an outstation for Limbunya which was called Wave Hill oh yeah um, back in the sort of 70s 60s 70s sort of around the whole Gurunji sort of stuff going on then and um, I had just my grandmother used to tell me a lot of stories about sort of you know I initially wanted to go up into the territory but I couldn't get up there so then I ended up going to the channels but um, it was just a lot of the whole history and the stories of the driving teams um, read a lot of books so like Hell West and Crooked with Tom mm. Cole and stuff like that. River, that yeah, they got me really interested in all that kind of stuff. You know, I think I just really wanted to go chase buffalo or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a fantastic photo. For those who haven't read the book, we'll put it in the show notes. Um, Hell West and Crooked, and there's a fantastic photo. I'm just on the front, depends on what version. And he's he's got a buffalo fair up his ass. He's on a when he's on a horse. Yeah. He's leaning back with a probably a three oh eight or a three oh three or something. Yep. And it's just incredible, isn't it? Yeah, it's like, chasing him and he's just about to... Because that's how he used to drop them, sort yeah. of like in the paddock. It was like he'd get them to chase him so he'd get a clean shot. On the head. Yeah. Behind. Yeah, so I read all of those books through high school as well, sort of. It got me really interested in it. And I just loved Sid Kidman and all the stories you heard about sort of driving from sort of Camel Wheel South and stuff like that. So, And I loved horses and I loved mustering, so I was just kind of... What I wanted to do. Yeah. So a year of that or two or what did you do? I did sort of nearly four years of that. So I did a year down in the Channel Country and then I went up to the Gulf and I worked up there for two years on a place just north of, in between Julia Creek and Normanton, yep. which was a big breeding block. Um, a lot of Brahmin cattle and yeah, they were it was really good mustering and good fun up there. Um, and then I went home after that. So I ended up on a sort of a stud. There was a property sort of down around Springshaw, um, which was the stud for a lot, lot of the AA bulls that went up north. Oh, yeah. What was that? What was that place? I can't remember the name. I've lost a shoe. On. Yeah, I can't. Um, it feels a bit weird just having one shoe on. It does. It? I want to take that because <laughs> I, I know a bit spooky. You are about that one shoe might feel a bit lonely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, look, and then I went there and then I just, I got, I was at a point where I was working at this property, I was like, I'm in the area, I'm in, I'm back home, mm -hmm. I'm working at this property, I may as well just go home and work on my home, like family property and yeah. also ride my own horses and stuff like that. So, yeah. So yeah, so then I went home and I went contract mustering for two years on my own type thing around central Queensland, just mustering for people. So you were what age, 24, 25 no, by then? I was 20... Oh. 
so 22, 23, yeah, 24, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, saw some really bad droughts around that time as well. Yeah. That sort of, I was in, I was really aligned, I was really in line to sort of run the family, family farm, take over. And, you know, I was, I felt really certain that that was my, you know, calling and that, that was the road I was going to go down. And then, just some really bad droughts, you know, you know, 2002 mm. around that time. And I just got, I got spooked by it all. You know, I just kind of found it really, really tough. You know, I saw that, you know, the impact it had on my stepdad, who I was extremely close with, um, on my mum, you know, on the family, on the livestock, on the land. And uh, I just had to get away. I just sort of had to had to move on and I went and auditioned for drama school. <laughs> really? Before yeah. we get there, so that, that's, because that's probably not an uncommon thing, is it? I think that, you know, I often hear people, um, you know, just, they just don't want the life and it's kind of crazy because you think it's quite romantic and those, for those who aren't farming, you think, oh, why would, why would you leave that and it sounds all beautiful but it can really be very, um, not debilitating but just, you know, it can just yeah push people away. So, I don't want. I saw my mum and dad and how they were. I saw the land, yeah. and that's not my that's not my future. You know, which is kind of. I mean, we might get to it, but you know, I, I'm a firm believer in it. Doesn't have to be that way. You know, it doesn't have to be. The a dry period doesn't have to have the f- impact on a person and a property and a business that it has. And I'm this is not being critical of anyone. I'm if I'm being critical, it's of myself because I you know. If I had kids when I was much younger, I'm sure they wouldn't want to hang around either. Yeah, and I think like sort of coming out of the 90s, I think it was a tough time as well financially for mm. us because we'd sort of got a massive loan. We had really high interest rates still from the 90s type thing and yeah. um, a lot of pressure on that. And it was just the just melting pot for, you know, things to happen. And then I just decided, you know, I just needed needed to get away and... I had a mate sort of who was living in Brisbane at the time and just sort of said, look, let's just go down, come down here. And also I had all my Italian family in Brisbane as well that I sort of hadn't spent much time with. So, And why, and why what, what was it, drama? What was it, a, a arts yeah. degree or something, was it? Uh, it was a fine, fine arts degree, yeah, in, in acting. So yeah. it, why, that, why that of all things? Um, I love film. Yeah. I love movies. I love, you know, the storytelling aspect of it. I think, um, and I feel like acting was the easiest sort of way into that world for me at that point in time, I think. It was the only way, I'd, like, I'd, I'd actually never done drama at school. Um, I hadn't acted before. I'd never acted. I just sort of went and auditioned. I thought it was a bit fun. And then, so you had to, did you have to audition for the course? Yeah, yeah. Really? so I had to audition for the course. Um, and then when you handed in your, your CV, and they're going, oh, and Andy Carbone's up next. <laughs> and they're going, oh, that's a blank bit of paper. Charlie, I, I grabbed <laughs> two monologues. I didn't even know what a monologue was. <laughs> and I grabbed two off the internet. And I don't know, I just grabbed these off the internet. And they're like, oh, that's great. Because we listen to a thousand, you know, Romeos or Juliet's <laughs> a day, so... Oh, so you, you, yours yeah. are just so, so totally off the cuff, like as in yep. they'd never heard of before. It was like they were, yep. just, they were pleased that you'd yeah. been quite novel in yeah, your approach. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Can so, you remember what they were? No, got no idea. I think one was a jewel thief and he was nervous about something and um, which played really nicely into the audition piece because I went in there like, didn't know the lines. I was like, oh. Yeah. So you were, you were naturally nervous, which was... Oh, but I wasn't at this point. I was really cocky and I just handed them a piece of paper and said, I don't really know my lines, so can you just sort of say line? When I need it? <laughs> and they did it. And then they absolutely chewed me a new one. They just said, you are wasting our time. You cannot come in here unprepared like this. We've got, you know, we're seeing X amount of people a day and you've just wasted our time. And I got so nervous and I was like, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean it. And then they said, do it again. And I did it that nervous like that. And it was, it was, exa- kind of good. It was exactly what it, it needed, that piece. So. Wow. And then you did, there were two. Oh, I walked outside and I was like, oh, you know, what, what have I done? And they ran out and they said, oh, 
you, that was amazing. You did a really good job. <laughs> I so you my, one up again. my head was just like screwed now. Like, what are they talking about? <laughs> I've got no idea what's happening here. <laughs> Welcome and, to the world of drama. Yeah. So, and they said, and then I got a recall. I didn't get in that year. And then I went off and I was going to do a Chippy's apprenticeship. And then I, um, I just decided I'd audition again and got in the second year. So, <laughs> did you do the same piece because you know? No, you no, I didn't. I didn't. I actually worked and did it properly. And yeah. they, they actually said to me, oh, when, "You're not going to get in." And then you know, they got I got in. And so how many years was that? How many years in? Three in, years. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty hardcore. It was. I think at that time in my life, it's exactly what I needed because I felt like with all the work that you do through drama school and stuff like that, you actually have to drop in what's going on to your emotion and to your feeling and be okay with that like be okay with anger and, and being in a f- feeling of anger and um because it was very method based the school mm. i went through so they spent you spent the whole first year of actually just understanding emotion and understanding what you know what that is how that feels in your body all that type of stuff and i think that sort of that was kind of like the first part of my regenerative journey i suppose in the world it's just sort of working and doing, being at, having that time to be able to work on myself as, as a young man to kind of understand what, you know. Because, you know, I think like country kids as well, you just find that where, you know, like to be fearful of anger or anger is something that you should be shameful of or whatever. And so like all of that, I came with all that baggage into that room and then to have the freedom to be able to, Cry on cue, learn how to cry, like learn how to, you know, access your anger or your fear or your vulnerability. It was, it was, you know, like I think it sort of put me in good stead for the rest of my life. Was it kind of liberating? You know, like you can, oh, yeah. it was a, re- a kind of re- release, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Because it's sort of like you, it's, I think, you know, farming in a lot of ways, you know, like it's quite, I don't know how to say it, like, Safe, safe, safe or yeah. conservative in some ways. Mm. And then to be able to go to a place like that where, you know, you are liberated, you can, you know, sort of sort of feel into however you wanted to. You could play characters and all this kind of stuff and actually tap into yourself was really good. Like that's where I found yoga, you know, I found meditation through certain practices through the school. Um, I met a whole lot of people that I wouldn't wouldn't have met in central Queensland. So I was going to say, what do they reckon about somebody ringing from the top end turning up there? Oh, we we would have been the only country. Bo- well, no, uh, only country boy, I wasn't no. the only country boy, but I was the most. They they'd all a lot of them had done work. They'd sort of been working actors or done been, something at school, done something or, at school, yeah. um, professional shows and stuff like that. So. I was kind of like a cowboy <laughs> just coming in. Yeah, I can imagine and I was that. a bit of a disruptor. Blanky, blanky piece of pelican chips yeah, just turning just, up there. Hello. Just just a disruptor in some ways. But um, <laughs> but that was probably – but your contribution was probably enormous. Possibly. Given, given you're a bit of an outlier, that, that's kind of, that would have pushed them in some way as well. Yeah. Yeah, I still – I think so. I think – for me, though, it was just really good. I, I, I really like I, I like those pressure situations where I get myself into this place where, like, I've got to go on stage. I've never been on stage. I've got to get in front of people, <laughs> you know. And then I'd get an absolute chewing from one of the one of the acting coaches going, "Mate, you're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong." And then, I, and then I'd freak out, and they'd be like, "Okay, let's go again. Pull it together." Yeah, yeah. And then by third year, it sort of started to all find its way. And it all started to land for me, sort of what acting was, um, which was really good. Yeah. Did you, you know, new chapter in your life? That just for the listeners too. Where that the highway is particularly noisy today because mm. I've done this. I've just interviewed many times here. It's really maybe it's the wind carrying across there. So I'm sorry, everyone, if there's that sort of roar in the background there. I'm not sure if Reese can can do much with that. Um, so where was I going? I'd uh, also still go home every every holiday yeah, to work yeah. Yeah, and do the work at home and sort of connect back with my roots because I felt that was really important as well just to not get too caught up in the world of, I don't know, like the acting world, I suppose, or that kind of, you know, artistic kind of world and I'd go home and I'd get on a horse and I'd go mustering. Get grounded again. Get grounded, yeah. What did your mum and stepdad think about just you down there, bloody yahooing and, um, and probably having good too good a time 
mum loved it because she was sort of that way inclined. And my dad was also part of the film, like the whole kind of 80s revolution in, in 70s, 80s revolution in film in Australia, like in really? Brisbane. Yeah, he was a... Your, your dad? My dad, yeah, yeah, my dad, yeah. yeah. Okay. He, was a, he was a gaffer, like used to do lighting and also location scout mm-hmm. and then um, a couple of other things. So any time. movies that spring to mind that he worked on in those years? Any? Uh, he's got a I heap of old roles. Mm. In, you know, we've still got all the old sort of um, canisters of the films that he sort of worked on and stuff like that. There was a Hugo Weaving film that he worked on. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember the name, but um, yeah. So they, Dad was just like, "Don't do it, don't do it, oh. do a degree, <laughs> don't do it, don't do it." <laughs> he was trying to yeah. send you. Yeah, he was just like, "Just don't do it." Why? Then, why was? Why, why do you think that? Because there was no money in it. There was what did it? What, what was? The, what was the? Yeah, I think. I think he was. He just saw it as. He said, just do something safe. Mm. You know, there's no security in it. There's no, you know, it's a hard road. Um, so he just sort of didn't see the value in it. Yeah. But I don't, I don't, I don't see you as that kind of guy, safe kind of guy. No, well, I wasn't at that stage in my life. And, and also, like my stepdad, he was okay with it, but he just did, he was totally confused. <laughs> <laughs> he, <was> like, <laughs> he had no idea. And I used to have this, this old ringer used to come out home. His name's Jimmy Sue. He's like, <laughs> Jimmy Sue. Jimmy Sue. He was uh, he was half Chinese, oh, but yeah. he put an E on the end of his name, so no one so no one knew that he was half Chinese. But he kind of did he look half Chinese? No, he didn't because he was so wrinkled from this amount of sun oh, that he had right. through the forties and fifties. You couldn't yeah. couldn't really. But he had you could see it a little bit. But um, he used to come out all the time. Like he used to come mastering with me. He used, he used to give me knives, guns, you know, all that kind of stuff. He goes, what do you want to do? Become Keith Ledger. <laughs> <laughs> Keith Ledger. <laughs> so, yeah, so... Um, he Good was, on you, Jimmy Sue. Jimmy Sue? Jimmy Sue, yeah. Jimmy Sue. He, rode, he used to tell us stories about he used to ride 40 miles just to get into a fight. <laughs> <laughs> just when for he, the hell of it. Yeah, because he used to work sort of up sort of north of Charters Towers and that kind of country, and that country is pretty rough. Yeah. Rough country, rough cattle country. And yeah, he taught me a lot about sort of cattle and things like that yeah so did you go home and like do performances for no for, way. for mum and no, their dad no way <laughs> no. Little, not, not, not little renditions no i just put on my tutu and sort of dance around and stuff <laughs> i used to do that down at the dam when i'd get the ball no. <laughs> <laughs> just pump the water up to the house <laughs> no, that's no. fantastic so you, you're clearly um keeping grounded so finished um finished the degree or the the course yep and and what practical stuff happened then? Like as in, you know, few, yeah, few gigs on stage, film. So you finish, you finish drama school thinking the world is your oyster. Yeah, and then you get a reality check when you step out into that world. What happened? Um, I had, I showcased really well for in, you showcased down in Sydney with in front of a number of agents, and I showcased. Um, Quite well, and I got quite a quite a good agent, and then I started the audition process started happening. So when you say showcase, you you, you what, what do you actually got to perform a bit? Yeah, you got to perform. You know, you perform like a piece on stage. Okay. Um, I actually wrote my own sort of turned a story around about uh, saddle bronc rider, and it was, it was actually from the sister's point of view, and I turned it around from his point of view, and and I did a monologue down there. Yeah, so, nice. Um. So yeah, so you go down there, you showcase, you know, you you know, your your chops in front of a mob of agents, and then you wait by your phone. Is that <laughs> right? Cool, yeah. Then you do other work, like you get do bar work or something. Yeah, I, I never wanted to work in a bar. Like I, I worked in, um, I worked in a bar in Brisbane for a little bit, mm. and I just didn't want to be indoors. So I landscape. I was doing some landscape gardening while auditioning in Sydney. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So, because um, I worked a little bit in construction in Brisbane as well, so it was an easy transition for me just to find the work down there. And uh, yeah, I started doing landscaping, and then and then ended up sort of running, running, running jobs. Um, so, and then when did you did you was there a point at which um, I don't know low point, high point, hit the big time? You know, was there sort of a point? Along just you know, after, along there that where you went, this is for me, or 
No? What what was sort of the next sort of significant yeah. little so, corrections or, or not? Yeah, so I found initially coming out of drama school, getting an agent and just auditioning, I was getting back-to-back auditions for a lot of stuff and, and enjoying it. Um, so that was quite a high for me. And then I just went through a big lull where I was like, I got stuck, you know, I'd never lived in Sydney before. Um, it's a lot faster than what Brisbane is. Um, Red, there's your hand. Hello. Yeah, and it's quite. Um, yeah, it's it's a faster pace. Just trying to figure out living, you know, living arrangements where we were living. Um, I also moved down with my now, you know, wife now. Um, so it was just sort of navigating all of that and also the world of acting and sort of getting really immersed in that, in the kind of creative world in Sydney. So I just sort of went through a stage where I was like, it was great for a while and then it was like, oh, I don't know if I want Pla- to do that. Plateaued. Yeah, plateaued for a while. And then I got the role on How's That? And that was kind of the first sort of television, real television sort of thing that I'd sort of done. And Is that where you met Dan? Yes, yeah, that's from Matt Damon. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, so what was he like? What was he like? He won't listen to this. <laughs> oh, you know, it's you know what goes on tour. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was young and needed the money. You both. Did. <laughs> and then I sort of realised that you know from that point, you kind of do a lot of standing around as an actor or doing film. I love stage and I love doing stage mm. stuff. But as a film actor, it's a lot of standing around. They get the camera set up, you get in there, you do your thing, and then they have to quickly move on. And then you the go time. and wait for the next bit. Wait for the next bit. And so, and I really loved watching the directors and, you know, the crew sort of hustling around there. So I, I sort of helped out a bit. After that uh, sort of film, uh, after that experience, I sort of got more back into the, into the crew side of things and, okay. and was helping a bit, like, helping lighting, you know, do, doing lighting or sort of, you know, a bit of camera stuff. And and then I got into a bit of directing and stuff. So, yeah. So you, but you're not, but, and you directed, um, you directed a couple of movies, did you, films? A couple of little short films, films, yeah. Do you call them movies or films? Uh, I don't know. It depends how sort of wanky you want to be. <laughs> Oh, 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 it's more wanky. No, no, I like film. I, I like, like when people the old times say film. I like film. Yeah. Film? Yeah, yeah, say yeah. That. Say film. Film. There you go. Yeah. See, it sounds better. Yeah, it does. I like film. I yeah. like calling them films. But, um, yeah, I, I, I sort of directed a couple of couple of shorts that sort of, sort of, I was really passionate about trying to tell country stories as yeah. well. So it, it was always around, you know, either the location. I actually shot one at Burua. So, you did tell me that. Yeah. What was that one called? It was called Shooter. It was, it was about mental illness and, oh, yeah. Because so. now was a Borua. Can you remember where you, where, what property you're at? No, I can't. No. Someone from Borua will, will tell me. How long ago was that? So it would have been 2004, 15, 16. So yeah, Lincoln. Yeah, 16, yeah. Oh, I'm going to look that up. Whose place? Was it, do you remember which way out of Borua? Uh, yeah, you went, we went... Oh, it's hard now. But you go straight, you don't turn right. When you're going from Yass, like going north. To your place. Yeah. You just go straight down that road. I'm pretty sure it was down that one. Uh, up in the hills a bit more. Yeah, I'm, I think so. I can't remember. It was just all a blur out there. But yeah. It is a bit out there. It's nice. It's towards Reed Flat. I like I like Boroa. Good spot, Boroa. Mm. Anyone doesn't know, I'm from Boroa. And if you don't know what Boroa is, Better how, it up dare, on how dare you? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, so that would have been high, certainly a high point. Oh, it would have been just downhill from there. Yeah, it was gone. No, that was it. <laughs> so, yeah. And then... Are you road shooter though, yeah? Is that right? Is yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And what was, what was that? What, I mean, why? Was it a... Um, I had a lot, like... I had a couple of... I had some close mates sort of just out of school sort of um, kill themselves and it was kind of I think it was a process of me trying to figure that out I suppose in a way in a way and just sort of addressing that in, in some in some respects so um, you know it's a, it's a problem in regional areas Th- these were regional friends yeah, yeah 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 sort of like I, I think I've had 
Oh, well, I have had sort of four people, four, four, four mates sort of kill themselves. Um, yeah, from regional areas. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, it was just kind of. I think it was just trying to trying to work that out for myself in a way, and actually writing about something that I sort of that mattered to me as, as well. Yeah. And you obviously, you know, you've been from the land. You kind of understand the pressures and the strains and the the nuances of living living in the country and yeah i think it's a lot like there's a lot of silence out there and i think i think that sort of that yeah i think i think that's the that's the thing there's a lot of you know stillness and and silence and and i think you take that on board a lot and a lot of people just don't talk about how they're feeling you know and talking about what's going on and and have a fear about have fear around talking about what's going on for them. So I was just trying to, you know, put that into a film. Anyway. How, just on that, and it, it is a really, you know, uh, I won't say a wonderful topic, but it's a really important topic. What, what, What is, because it's everywhere, but it does seem to be exacerbated somewhat in rural communities, and you, I think you're probably right there, you know, the, the isolation. Is there any... Given your experience with that, or your understanding, and and this being sort of a way for you to reconcile it, what what is there any that door's about to get you? Um, what is there anything you can suggest to people listening that you know if if that they might do or think about, or I don't know any tips around it, or you know the organisations you know of, or you know just sort of digging into that 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 um, that topic a bit. We can we can dig further into that. My dad actually. He killed himself in the start of 2020 as well. So um, I know there's, there's, I think there's Black Dog, which is a good one and stuff like that. Um, but, but I don't, I, I don't know. Like I think now that I've actually experienced it pretty f- like firsthand with my dad, can't get much closer. Than that. I don't, I don't think there's much. I don't know. I, I just think. Um, it's sort of changed my whole perspective on what what suicide is as well, in a way, um, and sort of made me think deeper about, you know, like the the programming around it and things like that. Like my dad, he was a Vietnam veteran, came back, you know, he was eighteen or whatever when he was nineteen when he went over, came back with PTSD, didn't know what that was, spent a lifetime trying to deal with it, um, you know, at the end of the day, just sort of got too much for him. And it's probably the wrong thing to say, but I, I, I've got to this point where I can, like, in in this circumstance, I can res- respect his decision, you know, like I can sort of, and that's the only way that I can reconcile mm. with that and sort of justify his decision as well is sort of actually sort of, you know, accepting it and just going, look, this it, it was his choice. And that's why I kind of also like to use the phrase of, killing himself he killed himself rather than suicide because it's sort of I don't know it's a choice it's a choice yeah in a way yeah you know it's interesting you say that because I just listened to a podcast this morning with um, um, Ryan Holiday and Jocko Willink you know he's um, he's he's special forces Um, Ryan is a stoic um, he's he's written plenty of books he'd love them actually about stoic philosophy Mm. Um, and Jocko Willick, he's been, um, he was a special commander, you know, special forces guy. He's written some fantastic books, and they and, and they did they talked about about um, reconciliation, well, reconciling with oneself as to their 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 situation, you know, and that being a choice, and that being, you know, no one, as you said, no one can take that away from you because no one is standing in in that person's shoes, mm. you know. And and also this is just my personal experience with this yeah. as well, and it's not I, I, it's not at all, you know. Everyone has their own experience with 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 this kind of thing, so I don't want it to I don't want to come across that it's sort of you know a new way of looking at it. But you know, it's just it's just have my own experience. But but yeah, there is I think, um, and you know, that that also kind of made me make some decisions. You know, I've got a lot to be thankful. And, and a lot of gratitude around, around, you know, my my dad's passing and stuff like that. Because I don't think that I would have been able to, for one, I wouldn't be here, in this spot, in this location, with you know, 
talking to you because it sort of it was sort of like a a transition for me into uh, and a time for me to really ask some hard questions about sort of what I was doing with my life, why I was doing it, you know, who am I like, who am I serving? Am I, you know, is it all about ego, film stuff, or is it, or why am I doing it? So it's it really made me sit back and when it first happened, um, I just said. I had a lot of, you know, I was doing a bit of script editing for for some stuff that I was looking to get get up and film stuff that I was looking to get up, and I just I just said no to it all. I just went, look, I'm just walking away from this at this point in time, and and by this stage in our life, uh, my wife Candace and I, we we have two two boys. We're living down the Southern Highlands, um, and I was working. I was getting. I was back into farm management down there. So I was sort of looking after a number of different places down there of different sizes and things like that. Um, and uh, it was, you know, I just just said no to all that film stuff and then just, you know, walked out into the paddock and just spent a lot of time sort of um, with myself, you know, out there and doing things, yeah. Looking for more information to assist your regenerative journey? Come join Charlie and his guests around The Kitchen Table, an online community of supporters with exclusive access to the Regenerative Journey interview transcripts, live online Q&A sessions, a chance to engage with other like-minded people and more. Go to www.charliearnett.com.au forward slash The Kitchen Table and we look forward to sharing a yarn with you. Now let's get back to this week's episode. What did it do for you to have spent that time to, to go into the paddock? What were you trying to do? Um, I think I was trying to categorise things. I think I was trying to figure out, like I, I just really just asking a lot of questions and also just taking the pressure off as well. You know, taking the pressure off, having to achieve, having to be something that, you know, I thought that I, that I wanted and to realise, you know, like I had some serious realisations around sort of why I was doing film. And a lot of it was just to say, up yours to my dad, to say, yeah, it can be done, I can do this. And then once I took, once I actually named that, mm. I was able to let it go and just have a clean break from it and just sort of not not be attached to it in a way. And I, I realised that a lot of it was to do with my ego and a lot of it was to do with, me needing needing to be seen in some way, I think. So, you know, once I was able to sort of name that, that actually open and sort of walk away from that kind of part of my life, I, it sort of, it just opened a door. It just sort of gave myself, gave me room to actually explore and be open to, you know, where I go to next. And it, that's when I sort of, um, I saw Damon down in, I think it was, he came down to Barrel with 2040. Oh, yeah. And I saw him down there and I just sort of started to look into all the regenerative kind of farming practices and things like that. And, you know, I had a chat with him about it and, you know, he told me some of these like pretty inspiring stories and said that I should get in contact with you. Um, and then that sort of made me sort of, made me still there. Yeah. <laughs> that, that made me, uh, you know, like pick up pick up some books, listen to some podcasts. This is twenty twenty. Yeah, twenty. Yeah, like this was twenty. Yeah, twenty twenty. Yeah. So you know, like by that stage, I was already kind of trying to figure out what to do in the paddock. You know, like regeneratively, sort of. You know, because also twenty twenty nineteen, twenty twenty. There's not much grass around. It's pretty dry. Mm. Fires. It was. It was pretty apocalyptic down the southern highlands, anyway. And um, so I was sort of, I was sort of asking all those questions as well about sort of how to transition into regenerative farming and what to do. And that's when I picked up the reed warbler and stuff like that, and just inspired me. Like, and going back to the reason I left 
farming in the first place was because of drought and then to realise that there's all these kind of new ways and ways to manage land to actually try and hold on to moisture or, or you know, look after your grasses for as long as you can to get yourself through drought, that was just, you know, just mind-blowing. And why, because you could have, you could have, what was the step into the or the push or the pull into regenerative? Because you could have just decided to do a better job at farming, you know, conventional farming, mm. whatever. Or, or we had you always had a bit of a hankering for a different way of doing it. Mum, mum always wanted to go organic. So mm. we had our next door neighbour. They had they have seventy thousand. They did have well, they still do seventy five thousand acres next door to us up, up at Emerald, and they were organic in the nineties, early nineties. So yeah, wow. Um, so there were people doing it um, and also I think like you know I've heard you talk about it on the podcast a little bit and other people have spoken about it it's like my, you know Candace my, my partner she she um, she kind of like just sort of lit something up you know I think it's like that kind of guidance she, there's a lot of guidance from her so area. she so her conversation she was having or, or her buying habits or her conversations and also like just I think instinctually she just knew there was a better way she just, mate she's a woman yeah 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 <laughs> they kind of get it's, it's like hard to it's, it's like hard to take sometimes <laughs> it's, it's hard, true it's hard for men to admit that <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah look I think just in her intuition around it and stuff like mm. that and and uh, which kind of opened up because I was I was also very oh it's hard to do in this area you got fluke you got all this kind of stuff mm. going on and you know I don't know how to get around that and you know you look at all the problems but rather than looking what what kind of solutions are out there so and I think that's a lot of that's a trait a lot of farmers have as well it's always sort of looking at the problems so um, that was it really sort of. And just get it being inspired by, you know, reading certain books and stuff like that. And Any other? Oh, no, I'll ask you that later. Mm. I'll ask you that one later. Um, so Highlands, managing, what were the, it's an interesting situation to be in that you are man, have we manage, you know, some farms down there mm. and you like, what do you, what do you say to, what do you say to the owners? You're going, hey, the, the, who may or may not be used to conventional sort of, you know, throwing super out and, mm. and, you know, drenching sheep with, normal drenches and you turn up with I don't know some crazy stuff and talking about well what what are they did they did, they, did you did you get the sack or did they go oh, wow you're crazy that's cool no it was like I think down there you know Sid, it's a, it's quite a specific area down in mm. the highlands like and I can talk from my experience down there but I feel like it's been heavily influenced by sort of dairy down there down it, yeah. with the amount of super that goes out and all that kind of stuff and I think that there's a lot of people who are still who are trying to do good good things down there just with farming in general but they've still got this kind of stigma of like you need that you need this you've got to do this and so and also it's a melting pot where a lot of wealthy people from Sydney move out they buy land and stuff like that so they're looking for they're looking for guidance in some way and it's kind of like you got to be quick to get get in there first you know mm. to sort of because they're they're buying a property without knowing without having much knowledge about farm and stuff like that and so you know like those initial first those first initial conversations are quite important and sort of like how you action a lot of that stuff as well you know um but like they were it was quite tough sometimes to have those conversations and a lot of the time it just would lead to a dead end mm. and it, nothing would happen um so did, did then you just go i'm i'm this is, i'm gone i'm out of here I, I'd, I'd kick a lot of dirt in the paddock and swear and yeah. just, just go and throw sticks but um <laughs> but at the end of the day it's their decision and and you know and also one of the places that i was working at he'd actually been burnt by someone who'd actually gone in there and tried to push too hard and went you know, just drop everything. We're just gonna, and just got the place into a really bad state. So he because he'd sort of he'd gone too far. Gone the other too way. far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and also he hadn't had like there wasn't much water around. You know, they'd, they'd lost cattle and things like that. So he was very hesitant to go back in. Sure. Um, but I found a lot of the other, like a couple of the other places. One, one particular, he was interested in what I had to say. 
but it wasn't until his granddaughter sent him through a link of something that he was actually keen to make, you know, make changes. You'd warmed him up a bit, though, probably. Probably, yeah, just sort of gave him a little jab little under jab. the ribs or something. Yeah, yeah, nice. Mm. And then what happened then? You, so you're that was last. Well, then I, I met you. Damon actually got us in touch. Yeah, you came along to a biodynamic course, biodynamic workshop down yeah. there in. Um, when was that last year? September. Yeah, at your place. It was too. Yeah. Went to one at your place and then I went for you a, went to the follow up at yeah. The yeah. Um, yeah, in the Highlands, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Oh, I remember workshop. What do you think of that? Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like well I I like um I suppose I like the I, I like the planetary alignment stuff, mm. you know, and I, I like that sense that you're doing something, but you you know you you're doing something in the paddock, but you're also aligned planetary with stuff that's going on outside of you know your control your control in a way. Um, it's a deep rabbit hole, so you know, yeah. still trying to sort of get my head around it a little bit. But um, I see the value, definitely see the value in it. Mm. Well, we got um, uh, Oliver. Oliver's actually featured quite a few times in in my interviews here because he's either. I, He's at, well, the last two times I've sat, he's driven past and he's buggy. Um, I must have done another one at some point, not that long ago. Anyway, oh, Marcus Pierce, that's right. And so he must just go, oh, I'm going to just drive past in the buggy and make a noise. Start doing donuts in the grass. Start <laughs> <laughs> smoking the bags down. Um, his chickens escaped last night, apparently. Yeah, they did. Can we tell that to everyone? Yeah. We did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we did. Yeah. But they're back. They're back under under, under super, supervision, surveillance, mm-hmm. and um, he who he's sort of come in and out of a few of the workshops we did, um, and we on Friday. What's the day? It was no, it was Monday. Was it Monday? Monday, yeah, because yeah, yeah, Monday, and he we dragged the tractor out, we dragged the the um, tank, rigged it up, got the flow form going, still just around the corner there, and and he did uh, I don't know five hundred liters or something, and he just banged it out on on Monday night, mm-hmm. burned around doing putting the the biodynamics out. Yep. It's fantastic. Yeah. Which I'd, I'd, I'd been a couple of years since I did it. I'd burned around in the veggie garden down there in the same, with the same tank, different tractor, and um, just went nuts, sprayed it everywhere. Mm. People didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, hopefully it, it, it'll be something that we'll do a lot more of here, I'd say, just to sort of... Oh, I hope so, mate. Just see what goes and see what happens. So. Well, if Oliver's, you know, as keen as he is, I'm sure, he'd be he'd be the man. Just, just go, mate, just... Do a little paddock down there. Jump on, go nuts. He's keen. Throw him a few <laughs> bloody those Portuguese tarts in there in the restaurant or something. <laughs> bait him, bait him a bit. Yeah, and just get him out there. Yeah. Just get him out there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he was loving it. It's fantastic. So, mate, um, he was drenched. He was like, came back. Because <laughs> <totally worked. laughs> we we had we had a pretty good rig up on there. We found an elbow and we put the nozzle on the thing. Um, and so, for those listeners who aren't familiar with biodynamics, it, it's a it's a it's a water. Soluble, I, I guess. Um, uh, Fertiliser is the way I'd, I'd probably put it to, to the layman, um, it, but it's made from cow manure and a few other cool stuff, cool things. And Oliver was spraying it all over the place. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's an open cab, yeah. and he got wet. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? He's, he's he'd like he'd grow half a foot next time if he's if he's if he's absorbed it all, if he's soaked it all in. That's it. That's why all his, I, I think him. that's why all his hens chased him back. <laughs> <laughs> he's still wearing still wearing five hundred. He is. He's a machine. Mm. Um. So, mate, uh, back to you. Mm. Well, Oliver's he features far too often. Um. Yeah, Highlands. Mm. Beauty workshop, Burrowa. Yep. Yeah, and I think. For me, it was just really exciting to find these new practices, you know, like that's, and, and just to be excited, you know, to get excited about that stuff as well, um, about, you know, biodynamics. And also we our, our boys are going through the Steiner system as well. So, you know, like that's just really another, you know, offset of, of what Rudolf Steiner's kind of, kind of doing. So it kind of made sense to sort of do a, a workshop like that, but also... There's just so much good stuff out there now. Um, it's, it, like in Australia, people doing amazing things around around Australia with with regenerative farming, and it's just it's just really exciting. I think with all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Have you got any favourite um, practices or or sort of you know um, or any any you know um, 
Oh, any nuggets of gold that you sort of stumbled upon in the last, I don't know, 12 months that have really, really got you thinking you know, differently? Definitely the, around the soil stuff, I think, is, um, is just an eye-opener. And also, like, understanding plants a little bit more. I've just recently done the RCS, kind of uh, farming and grazing for profit, mm. to understand sort of, like, how you can actually manage your grass so the soil's getting the most benefit, but also the animal is as well. So that's, you know, a lot of stuff around that was really, really interesting, I think. I think, and they've got a great way of kind of sort of um, running their workshop, running the, running the course as well. You know, they sort of, you kind of go through the financial stuff to actually then make a astute decision about sort of which way you should, the choices you can make. And they actually then give you solutions when needing to make those choices, which is sort of a great, a great thing. Um, and it's not think, really, it's not really, sorry, you go. No, no, no. Um, I'm trying to think other, other stuff. I think um, Peter Andrews stuff is quite interesting as well, you know, like around water, you know, and not trying, I think, you know, we've, we've got this sort of need to try and hold on to everything all the time, like hold on to our water, you know, hold on to cash in the, the account or whatever but if you let it all flow it sort of makes more sense to sort of it'll sort of help in the long run and it's sort of you just gotta let that energy kind of move i think also like one thing that i really enjoy is um i like i like with rcs and terry mccosker and that about the the energetics of things you know and i, I think oh, yeah. i think there's a there's a lot around the energetics that's sort of it's an interesting space you know i think it's something that um, there's so much more room, you know, to grow in that area. So subtle energy kind of stuff? Yeah, I think, like, just understanding the energy, like, it actually, I think, for me, my personal take on it is with the energetic, the subtle energy and the energetics of a place and sort of tapping into that to actually kind of feel what the what it needs, to, what needs to happen in certain areas. And, and I think it comes back to more instinct rather than actually pragmatic thinking in some way so it's sort of um that sort of resonated with me um it's i know it's not something that you can kind of hold on to but it's just it's just nice to know that it's there i suppose what's well, another it's another layer of i wouldn't call it a tool but it's certainly just another layer of, of potentially you know if used well of, of building confidence in a decision mm. or you know kind of I just think it's it's so under underrated. Mm. It's so hard to even talk about. You don't go to the pub and go, "Hey, I was talking to the kangaroos, right? Mm. Negotiating for them to just like leave my property, except for one little mob can stay there." <laughs> they take your drink, get outside. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yeah, no, Shut she's the door out. Shut <laughs> That's yeah, never return. <laughs> But it's when you. But it's the end. Of, but it's. But if you say those things it, it, towards the end of the night, it's interesting how people come up to you and go, "Hey, you know, you know that you said about those kangaroos, you yeah. know." And they start when they've had a few grogs and they get a bit curious about it. Um, and then there are some people who just want to. Because I also out. feel like we all have a relationship with the land in some way. You know, like I think as a kid growing up in the bush or whatever, you form a relationship with the land. So I think you're kind of halfway there, mm. but you just I think. You know, I denied it for a long time. You know that, but you know, there's some there's something there. So when 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 was the whether it was a moment or a period of your life where you stepped into that relationship with it? Was there a catalyst for that? Uh, I did a ten day silent meditation <laughs> retreat. Yeah, so, um, where was that? I did it up in the Sunshine Coast hinterland. When was that? Uh, I think 2008 or 2009. And I think I had a, you know, like that experience, you uh, you know, you'd meditate for many hours a day and then you'd actually go walking in the bush and stuff like that as well. And um, No talking. No talking. I saw a big snake and I cursed once because it scared me. <laughs> and I looked around to make sure no one heard. It was like day nine and a half. No, nah, sorry, get out. Yeah, you failed. You failed. Um, and then you just walk through nature there. And I, th- I think it's like that you realise that there's something else about, you know, the, you know, that tree's alive or, 
you know, there's some life there. I think that was maybe, I don't know if that's what you're asking, but that's that was kind mm. of like that's kind of like where I think I found found that. And also being out in the Channel Country, you know, like there's, you know, it's pretty amazing that two weeks it can be completely dry, and then, you know, we used to hear when when the water used to the Diamantina when the water used to hit the main road that goes from Winton through to Bulia, it used to take two weeks for the water to get to us. And then... Because uh, it'd, it'd be it'd literally trickling down the channels yeah. all the way, finding its way. What direction was it heading? South. South. Yeah, and then... And then... Or, and then you just... Like, within three weeks, you're... You're, into, you're an ocean. You're just surrounded by water. And it was just... I think, like, that... You know, that sort of triggered something in that country because there's real stillness out there as well but yeah it's quite quite special but um yeah i think that's kind of that's and that made me realize that there's something you know and that that land out well australia is quite ancient mm-hmm. and that country feels really ancient as well and then there's dinosaurs around and stuff still and, yeah well there's there's like fossils and mm. yeah I like to believe that there are that stuff. There's still stuff out there. We just we would be exasperated to find that still. I don't know. That would be really cool. I reckon there's Tasmanian tigers in Tassie. I hope so. You reckon? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. I think it'd be awesome. <coughs> I'm a bit of a I'm a bit I, I'm a bit of a believer in yowies and that sort of thing. Bunyips. Is there any yeah. bunyips up there? No, but my, my eldest, my youngest, he actually, he reckons there's bunyips, he reckons there's a dinosaur outside his window. Well, it's funny because Lordy goes around looking for fossils in the garden. Mm. Yeah, right. That's his thing. He's going to look for fossils. I think it's just beautiful. Mm. Um, you've, ven- you've mentioned the word silence a couple of times, which is really, really, which is great because I think, do you think we, because it's, I don't know. Is it is, is silence? Can silence be good and bad, or you know what I mean? Like, is there good silence and bad silence from from a farming kind of you know country farming life kind of kind of perspective? Because the way you've sort of used mm. it in different parts of what we talked about has been interesting. You know? There's definitely. I think there's a balance. You know, I think individually we kind of know. Well, individually, I know when I need silence, and then when that silence isn't probably, or well, that stillness is sort of, it's used by data's up, and then I actually feel like I need to transition into a different energy or or something like that. Yeah, um, and I think I think that's something you know, like with my personal journey through. I'm not like an avid meditator. I don't meditate every day. I try and I try and do a little bit, you know, five to ten minutes a day when I when I remember or something like that. But I think like, you know, I think that's I don't know where I'm going with this, but that's kind of that's the journey. That personal journey for me has been really important to find out how much silence I need. What's well, you? It's your time, isn't it? Yeah, probably a f- you know, few few minutes in the day where it's you. Mm. You know, and from, apart from when you're asleep, when you're probably not there anyway. Yeah, astrally traveling. Yeah, which is a whole other thing. And it's just a good time to connect with. Oh, I find it's always just a really good time to connect to with what's going on for me, even if it is five, ten minutes, just to go right. This is this is how I'm feeling today, or or whatever. It sort of you know makes me a better person in a lot of ways. Yeah. I've no doubt. I heard a um, great expression. I can't remember who from years ago, and it was uh, something I really resonated with me. Was you know it's um, I feel I, I often feel alone but never lonely mm. you know there's a difference between you know especially when I was a younger buck you know at home at a one, not married you know Tom Cadding in Sydney but but working hard all week and there'd you know there'd be people there but there was times when you know you would be by yourself and it was just fantastic weekends you didn't see anyone mm. and there was a sense of being alone but I was never lonely, you know. Yeah, which is which I'm which I'm grateful for because I imagine, um, 
that can be that you know th- there would be a sense of being um, being lonely you know for some people you know depending on the personality how you know geographically how isolated they are it's a it's a really it can be a really confronting thing and I guess from a mental health point of view that can be quite challenging for people you know whether it's that they ne- they've got a personality they need people around mm. um, or they're just going through a tough time and they just don't have that support you know yeah, yeah for sure um what next, Andy? Well, I don't know. Um, where do well, we get? Where do we get to? Well, Highland, you're in the Highlands. I'm in the Highlands. Yeah. You're reading books. Reading books. You were throwing sticks at bloody property owners who didn't <laughs> listen to you. Well, yeah. Well, not physically. Yeah, I was, I was you throwing are. sticks. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're opening gates onto the roads. I was so opening gates. Like yeah, just uh, causing havoc. Yeah, I was there. Um, I felt like I needed a change. Um, so actually. I felt like I was getting frustrated with sort of things not moving in the right direction. And, and I, I think I heard Terry McCoskis say somewhere or it might have been in the book that he, you know, like, oh, this is my own words, but like standing on your Apple box yelling, you're not going to really make much change. You know, so you, you only try and convert the converted. So I thought I'd sort of, you know, just try and find somewhere that I could land where... Um, they were interested in this management, you know, different different ways of managing and the regenerative way of sort of managing places and stuff like that. So I I quit a couple of jobs down there um, and just let that sit for a bit. And then I saw the opportunity arise up here at the, the farm and sent a text to you. <laughs> so, That's right. So you're... you're you're, what did you say? Do you know these people? You'll get in trouble if I don't. <laughs> well, I said, are you, are you up the farm? I said, that's, I said, do you know my, what's going on up at the farm at the moment? I didn't even know you hadn't. You're up here. Yeah. At that point in time. So, um, what did I say? You, you said, I'm looking for a thing. And I was going to say, no, they're not. No, 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 no. No, no, no. It's like, yeah, for you. It's like, just keep away. Keep away. No, there's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> prank call, prank call. Yeah, prank call. Um, yeah, so then you apply it. Well, no, I, I think you sort of reached out for me, actually. So, oh, actually, so I might have yeah, given Fraser a, a nudge. Yeah, yeah, you're the culprit. It's, it's, your, it's your fault. It's my fault. <laughs> Was it a good thing? Yeah. Not, not so much what I did, but, but you moving up here? Absolutely, yeah. It's, um, I think we were kind of also calling it in as well. We've got family around this area. My mm-hmm. mum's got a organic garlic farm up at Tennerfield. That's right. And my mother-in-law, she's out sort of Nimbin Way, so... It sort of made sense for us to move up closer to family. Um, and, yeah, it's like this, there's a really good opportunity here to sort of create, you know, add add, add on to what's going on up here. And I think there's, like, the community itself, it's really receptive. Mm. You know, it's the right, right sort of community to sort of make, to get behind something like this as well. It's an interesting combination, isn't it? Because it is, it's, you know, reasonably, you know, it's, Bit of land for up here, um, right on the edge of town, Byron mm. Bay, with you know various different enterprises, and for someone with your experience, I imagine that would be just um, no, I don't know about dream job, but it's certainly you know there is a lot of scope here. I think it's up there, know. yeah. No, it's definitely aligned with a lot of stuff I'd I'd like to do, you know, that I'm wanting to do and and things like that. So yeah, it's definitely definitely a great opportunity, you know bit of a dream job yeah now as you as you started the um the interview there andy you know just in terms of um i guess the opportunity and kids coming here i mean i saw the little sign just around there the kids where is it kids uh, kids club the Mm. um farm uh, farm kids um you know schools coming here i mean obviously not at the moment but um it is you know and i think it has got a huge um, potential which we we will work on in the future Mm. yeah it's it's really nice. Like we've we've bought up here now, land up here and stuff. So we're we're pretty set in the community. So yeah, it's good. It's really nice. Um, what else, mate? What other what other training what other training have you done that you think was, um, you know, set you up to, to for where you are for well, not geographically, but just for where your mind is now. Is there any, any other sort of training you did that was you know, personal development type stuff or things you can tell us about? Look, I think 
Oh, that's put me on the spot a bit. I think, well, I think a lot like the that the past and meditation mm. was a, was a big one. I think drama school was like I think that was the first paradigm shift for me in a lot of ways as well. It's like to actually see, and that helped me sort of be open to a different way of seeing things, looking at things. I think like sort of being around a lot of different people. Um, with different different views, you know, different opinions about about the world and stuff like that. So that sort of opened me up a lot, um, in a lot of ways. Yeah, uh, I don't know about other training. Um, well, any tips? Look, I do, I, no, no tips. Um, I was saying, do you any tips for? I mean, everyone's everyone's story is unique, and but is there any sort of? I don't know if there, are there if, if there were some tips you could give people, what, what would they be in terms of you know? Okay, there's, I'll make it easy for you, or maybe harder for you. Um, tips for okay, tips for a younger Andy. Oh. If you had, if you could have the chat with I don't know the fellow who came back from the ringer from the top end. <laughs> I'd say go off and be a ringer from the top end. <laughs> that was uh, it's a lot of fun when you're young, young mm. girl. Um, I just, I just say, I just be like, courage is a big one. I think that's a word that comes up for me, or being brave, or, and then also, you know, being open-hearted and vulnerable. I think as well. There's a lot of there's a lot of strength in vulnerability, which I think gets missed. And, you know, it's, it takes a lot for someone to actually be vulnerable and be open. This is actually not me talking here. This is Candace. <laughs> mm. But it takes a lot you know, to, for someone to actually be, be open, be vulnerable. And there's a real, real, real power in that, I think. Like if you can actually, it puts down, it doesn't, it, you know, it'll help other people be less guarded. I feel like as well. I think it gives everyone the opportunity to then sort of sit in that and 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 create a safe space. So, and women are generally better than that, bit better than us at, at that, aren't they? They seem to be a little less reserved about or worry about what people will think, you know, because it's it's more in their nature to just be a bit more honest about that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and I think um, I think with yeah, obviously men would. I'd, I'd rather go and throw a stick than actually show someone that I'm angry. Is being is 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 angry? Throw a stick. Do you stomp on your hat? Um, I try not to. Have you? Oh, I have. I've, I've have, thrown you, a, have you thrown on the ground and stomped on it? I've thrown on the ground and, and I've ridden over it on my horse. Again. <laughs> <laughs> Fair that was, that was I have not tried that. I've seen it. I've seen it happen. Yeah. And then get angry with my horse because my horse was shying at the house. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's just endless. This anyway. was this was nineteen as well. So anger, that's a good one. Um, and vulnerability, like, is that is anger is being angry okay? I mean, is that oh. is that a, is that a sign of being vulnerable as opposed to maybe throwing a stick at? I mean, oh, there's angry throwing a stick, but then there's also like, how do I actually express my anger in a positive way, in a, in a useful way? Yeah, I think that's definitely like, I think there's vulnerability in anger when it's being witnessed, mm. you know, and you're actually okay. This is my take on it anyway. You're okay with actually exposing yourself in that moment. That's that's actually you being vulnerable. It's being truthful too. Being truthful, it? yeah, being vulnerable, and also like I find. That oh, I just lost my train of thought, but it, I just feel like with the with that anger or that frustration, it's it's an emotion and it's going to pass. Like mm. you're not going to get stuck in anger, and like we also like with our kids and and stuff like that, we try and get them to see the full arc of what anger is and actually see resolution rather than just seeing sitting in anger. Sitting in anger so then they can actually see that yeah, there's another side of, of that feeling. So that's that's a big one for us as well. Well I think anger's also a um uh I guess it's a it's a symptom of fear in a way, isn't it? It's fear of mis- fear of something. It's you know, so there's a you know, um yeah, that's the way I look at it. I don't generally get too angry. I probably should get more angry a bit more often. I don't know. One of those things. Um, all, yeah. 
it, it, I think it also it, it's it. hiding something else. Yeah. So there's obviously something you can go deeper into. Mm. So like if there's anger on the surface, there's something that's yeah sometimes connected to fear or or whatever it is. But but it's um yeah you can actually if you're willing to go deeper into what that is. Here am I talking about this and I'm, I'm you know. Oh, you're made pretty quite highly qualified, I've got to say. Hmm. Um, the other one that just came to mind was also with that we can't be responsibles, responsibles. We can't be responsible for other people's reactions and or, slash emotion because often we see their reaction is a visible emotion that we see. You know that if we're being vulnerable, if we're telling, speaking our truth, and we're being courageous in that moment, sometimes harsh things have to be said or things that come across as harsh and, and people can be affronted or be, be, be you know, it, it's a, it's a, it can be potentially a point of conflict that sometimes has to happen and, and um, it's like, you know what, you know, hands in the air because mm. if we don't, and I do, I used to do that a lot, I probably still do it a bit, is I'd be worried more about the person, how they would react, I wouldn't actually instigate the situation which probably had to happen that would then potentially have them react that way and it was like, oh, it's just easy not to say it. Yeah. You know? Because yeah. I don't want to deal with that. It comes back with a conflict, doesn't it? Like but it's just a good result. Just, yeah, yeah, that's it. It's a fear of... And then I just, you know, it stays in your body and turns into something else, mm. which is not very healthy. No. It can turn into cancer or something like that. That's it. Yeah. No, totally. Totally. <laughs> bad, bad, bad shit. We can't be doing that. Um, what else? Oh, yeah. So what... what um, so that was tips for the younger Andy. Mm. Any other tips for sort of transitioning farmers, you know? Because you had, you've got you had quite an interesting journey that you weren't, I mean, you were farming on your little, I guess what I'm saying, you know, in the country, mm. did you step up north and you had a fairly bit of a break away from it, you know? Is it, what what tips for, for, oh. for transitioning farmers? I mean, because you... Well, well, my experience from it is, is the... There's a lot of things that you're probably doing on your farm now that isn't too far off, mm. you know, the changes that need to be made. Like mm. for us, you know, we were we were set stocking and stuff like that, but we actually had our carrying capacity or our numbers so that pretty bang on so that we wouldn't actually flog the country out yeah. too much. And we're actually looking at our rest periods back then, which I think a lot of farmers probably instinctually do, but aren't aware of what they're actually doing I suppose I don't know but that's what I thought like when I started reading a lot of the books and literature and things like that it's it seems there's a lot of practices that you are doing well there's just like a percentage that kind of just need a little shift or a little change that we're kind of really hooked into as well that if you just make those kind of little you know readjust those changes that you readjust those management techniques that are that are working well that aren't too different from you know, trying to get away from chemicals and stuff like that. I think that's probably the best step because you just, I feel I just get overwhelmed. If you look at one, if you look, you know, you've got to look out into the paddock in, in certain places and just go, well, where do you start? What do we do there? Yeah. I think the overwhelm can often be associated with like the old paradigm of being prescriptive. It's like, oh, I've got to go and do this. I've, you know, whether it's you're looking at your neighbour doing something differently and you want to try it or you're reading in a book is actually to go, I'm going to just, you know, just plant this on my land and do it. That can be quite overwhelming, I think. Because mm. it's like, how do I emulate that? You know, they've, they've got those results. I want them. But it's really about stepping in it pretty slowly, isn't it? And just, just trying. I think the, the fact, you know, anyone who's listening to this podcast is probably, as you've just sort of highlighted, they're probably doing those, some of these things anyway if, if, if they're a landowner. Mm. Like I think, you know, we used to, by managing our paddocks. Fred. Yeah. <laughs> red the white marina. marina. <laughs> oh, he's got a red collar. <laughs> I've got a red collar. Red, sit down. Um, yeah, I think like, you know, we were trying to manage tick through our, you know, through our sort of management of paddocks and stuff like that rather than having to dip mm. that much. You know, like I think there's a lot of things that we were doing that we're doing out of, you know, cost rate. You know, like you can't go out and spray... <laughs> No. Seventeen thousand acres for Parthenium or something like that, no. or you know, it was more more, more a practical approach. More to practical it. approach, and I think like if you actually, you know, come up from that angle, 
It's not, it's not too much of a paradigm shift. No. Really, yeah. And um, and it's and it's even like the word regenerative is reasonably new and, you know, it's sort of taken the world by storm, which is kind of good, but, I mean, yeah, a lot of people... Red! A lot of people would have been would be doing these practices anyway, and not just and still doing it. And probably a lot of people doing it now. Just it was like, oh, that's yeah. just why we do it. You know, yeah. we are we are we are conscious of costs. We are conscious of nature. We are you know conscious of things that you know um, we sort of are more you know regenerative farmers or farming is all about. But it's just it's just innate, which is wonderful. You know, because mm. the whole thing is just not prescriptive. You right there, buddy. You know, eat something. Eat a person. A tomato. <laughs> no, mate, don't eat that mint because that's what Andy's dog, um, Rusty, pissed on the other day. He, that's probably why he likes it there so much. Mm. <laughs> well, mate, I reckon we're going to wrap it up. I have got a little, um, some questions, some rapid fire questions for you that I'm, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sign out. And if anyone wants to get the, hear the answers to the rapid fire questions. I'm going to ask Andy. You just sign up to our pod, our um, Patreon, a kitchen table around the kitchen table membership platform, um, where you can hear these answers. We're trying something new. Um, we are asking us all of our Patreon members as well for uh, for questions that we want to be able to ask each guest um, consistently, as in you know the same set of questions and see what they come up with. Don't be nervous, mate. It's not. not it's, no going be, it's going to be okay. Thanks, Charlie. I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up. Mate, that's been wonderful. It's been a pleasure to sit here at the farm. Um, we've got pigs and bin chooks and corellas <laughs> and dogs. It's been one. I mean, this is, it is a great example of this is why I, I come here. I go to people's places and we, we have the chat on their veranda um, because this is inspiring stuff, isn't it? Mm. Well, we could be doing it inside somewhere. It's probably echoey and boring, but this is fantastic. And, um, it's a real, it's a real honour to be, to be part of the farm, and and and, you know, um, I'm I'm up here often, and just to be have such a wonderful place, to um to interview people like you, Andy, and to and be here and, and be part of it. It's awesome. And plovers, plovers. We got we got one mad dorper over there, as well. I saw a couple of sheep over there. Yeah. Didn't they? Yep. Mate, it's, it's all going on here. It's a menagerie. And they've got the Scottish Highlanders down there too. So we've just seen something because they're all bolting down the corner. And those horses there, they're little... What are those? They're oh, tiny. Man, it's a quarter horse. <laughs> quarter horse? <laughs> it is a quarter horse. It's an eighth horse, mate. <laughs> Andy, it's been fantastic. Um, really appreciate your time on a, on a Friday afternoon. And um, thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing um, your regenerative journey and, and being so um, open and transparent with us because that's what it's all about because it's the stories that... My guests, like you, tell that that are clearly resonating with with them, and um, and and I, I trust that they see value in that, and they they they're learning learning from learning from your your life and your experiences, and that's that's awesome. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, it's good to be a part of it. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. In next week's episode of The Regenerative Journeys with Gabrielle Chan, she's the author of the new book, uh, Why You Should Give a Fuck About Farming. It's a fantastic read. We had a wonderful interview at a farm at Harden in uh, South West Slopes in New South Wales. Um, <laughs> was, our, our time was limited, but we used the time very, very, uh, very effectively. Um, and I hope you enjoy next week's episode of The Regenerative Journey with Gabrielle Chan. This podcast is produced by Rhys Jones at Jaeger Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.